everyone, today we're going to take a look at the OnePlus Nord. This is a mid-tier smartphone that I've really come to love. Not because of any one specific thing about this phone, if that makes sense, but rather because of how well balanced I think this entire OnePlus Nord experience is. Now with that said, I really don't want today's review to overhype the OnePlus Nord either, because it's not foolproof. There are a number of things that the smartphone has and does that will detract from the premium look and feel that the Nord is trying to portray. And trust me, there really are quite a number of those things. But ultimately, I do wholeheartedly believe that this is a very nice and a surprisingly very well balanced mid-tier smartphone. And hopefully today's extensive review on the OnePlus Nord will help people who are interested in the smartphone to better understand what they're getting into. Now I do want to mention really quick that the OnePlus Nord is not available in North American markets as of this review, which is where I'm in. I reside in the United States with T-Mobile currently as my mobile carrier. So although you're watching a North American unboxing and review of the OnePlus Nord, please note that the unit I'll be using in this review is actually a European review unit. The only part of today's review that this will be affecting is my conversation about the Nord's cellular connectivity. So if you're near a market that the OnePlus Nord is actually coming to, just keep in mind that my experiences with cellular connectivity most likely won't apply to you. Other than that, I think you can find the rest of this review pretty dependable, regardless of where you're from. Here's a quick unboxing of the OnePlus Nord. It comes in this sleek black box that's accented with a cyan trim that comes from the inside of the packaging. The top lid slides off with ease, and once that's removed, we're immediately greeted by the smartphone itself. I'll unwrap that in a minute. Underneath the phone is a fairly thick packet that contains quite a number of things, a welcome letter is the first thing that I pull out of it. The next is a clear phone case, which I think is a nice little gift from OnePlus. Wedged inside of the case is a small envelope. All of the documentation is in here, but you also get a SIM eject tool and some stickers. Personally, I always like getting stickers with my electronics, I just think it's kinda cool. Finally, we get to the charger, and it's the North American variant of the Warp Charge 30T, not a European variant, which is good for me since, again, I reside in the United States. For those who don't know what this wall brick and cable combination offers, it's basically a fast charger capable of charging the battery at a rate of 30 watts. I'll give this charger a mention again when we get to the battery portion of this review. So now, with everything unboxed, we can get back to the Nord itself. This is the OnePlus Nord in blue marble, by the way, with 256GB of internal storage and 12GB of RAM. It's rocking the Qualcomm Snapdragon 765G with the Adreno 620 as its GPU. On Geekbench 5, these scores are, you know, not the highest numbers you're ever going to see, but they are pretty reasonable for a mid-range smartphone. The build quality of the OnePlus Nord is surprisingly nice. And I say surprisingly because this smartphone is made out of a lot more plastic than you think. But that's not really a bad thing since the utilization of said plastic is performed quite meticulously. Taking a look around the device, we have a glass front and back, a metal volume rocker, a metal power button, and a metal alert slider. But the entire frame on the OnePlus Nord, which tries to look like it's made out of anodized metal, is actually not metal. The frame is made of plastic and painted over with some kind of non-speckled metallic paint. And you can easily tell that this is the case without having to damage the phone, because you can see a textured distortion in the reflections upon closer observation. Reflections are never modeled like this with metal, so that's how you can tell it's paint over plastic. Additionally, people who are well acquainted with the feel of metal phones will immediately be able to tell that the frame of the OnePlus Nord feels a lot softer in the hand than most metal phones. Personally, I'm not a fan of plastic builds on premium devices. Most of the time, manufacturers simply just don't do it right, especially when it comes to lower-end smartphones and laptops. But to be fair, the OnePlus Nord technically isn't a premium device. It's ultimately just a mid-tier smartphone trying to look and feel like a premium high-end smartphone. But the way that OnePlus used plastic on the OnePlus Nord is quite appreciable. Nothing about this build quality screams, I made of plastic, and it's very apparent that there is a massive effort to make the plastic parts of the build look beautiful and luxurious. And for that, 
I find myself feeling strangely unbothered by the Nord's choice of materials. As far as port selection goes, you get one USB 2.0 Type-C port located at the bottom of the device. And that's it. That's seriously it. It doesn't have a headphone jack, and there isn't a micro SD card reader anywhere for storage expansion. So if that stuff matters to you, then you may want to look elsewhere. I wouldn't really call this a port, but I do want to mention that the dual SIM card tray is located to the left of the USB-C port, and this phone takes nano SIM cards by the way. On the front, you get a lovely 90Hz fluid AMOLED display, with an aspect ratio of 20 to 9 and a screen resolution of 2400 by 1080. It's easily one of the best things that the OnePlus Nord has going for it. This display has true blacks, the colors are nice and vivid but not oversaturated, and thanks to that higher refresh rate, it's really fast and smooth for those who can appreciate this kind of stuff. The display is completely flat, so no curved edges or anything of that sort. And I think a lot of people will really appreciate this about the Nord. Apparently, the smartphone has some tinting issues with the AMOLED display. But I must be lucky or something, because the display on my Nord doesn't seem to be showing any of the symptoms that others have been reporting on the OnePlus community for. I don't see any pink or green tinting on the display when grey backgrounds are on screen. If anything, there is some rainbow banding when looking closely at the screen from an irregular viewing angle, but I rarely see this banding in my usual day-to-day -day usage of this phone, so I honestly wouldn't consider that rainbow banding anything close to being a major issue. Near the top left corner of the display, there is a pill-shaped cutout for the dual front-facing cameras. Admittedly, there is a lot more space between those two cameras than there really needs to be. But even so, I find that this camera cutout isn't all that obtrusive as it looks. At the very least, it's much less conspicuous than that of a notch. So if you don't mind this cutout, then this display will easily top out as one of the best things about the OnePlus Nord, if not the best. And let's be real, the shape and placements of this front-facing camera cutout really should be the least of your concerns. Out of the box, the OnePlus Nord comes with a plastic screen protector pre-installed. One of the ways that you can tell is by locating this outline around the front-facing camera cutout. The screen protector is cut here so that it doesn't cover up the dual front-facing cameras. Again, I don't like plastic stuff. If I had to buy a screen protector, I most likely would have gotten a tempered glass screen protector. But that is if I had to buy one. Fortunately, this pre-installed plastic screen protector is applied to the OnePlus Nord so well that I actually think I'm going to keep it on my Nord for as long as I possibly can. I have to give kudos to OnePlus for installing this screen protector on the Nord so well. It saves me the hassle of having to buy a screen protector and then having to apply that screen protector myself. It's a very minor consideration for the customer, but an appreciable one nonetheless. There is an optical in-screen fingerprint reader by the way. It lights up a very specific part of the bottom half of the display whenever it's scanning your fingerprint, and I think it works pretty well, even with that pre-installed plastic screen protector on the display. It's not a super fast fingerprint reader, but I honestly don't mind. It's fast enough to get the job done, and that's pretty much it. I don't have anything else to say about it. To the right of the USB-C port, you get this down-firing speaker module that's just straight up mediocre. It emphasizes mid-range frequencies too much, and there's just no bass in the speaker whatsoever. Now obviously, you can easily address most of this with the help of a parametric equalizer. But honestly, that's such an unnecessary thing for most people to have to do, and it doesn't address the issues pertaining to the lack of bass. So overall, the speaker really isn't that good. Now, it's not the worst I've heard, but that doesn't matter, it's still mediocre, period. On another note, I'm really happy with the battery life I'm getting on the OnePlus Nord. Battery life is one of those more important things about a smartphone, unlike speaker quality for instance, so I think the battery life is going to make up for a lot of the bad things that this phone has. According to my battery statistics from the settings application, it seems like I've been able to comfortably hit 6 hours of screen on time every time I've drained the battery from 100% to somewhere between 1% and 10%. On a good day, I can hit 7 hours of screen on time, and sometimes even almost 8 hours, but never greater than or equal to 8 hours. So 6 hours of active usage seems to be a good number to hold your expectations to. The OnePlus Nord has a non-removable 4115mAh lithium-ion battery, so with Oxygen OS's software optimizations put into consideration, I think it's safe to say that my numbers hold up. 
This battery also supports fast wire charging at 30 watts, which is great for those who don't have all the time in the world to wait for their smartphones to charge. Of course, this was already expected since OnePlus makes it very clear that a fast charger is included with the OnePlus Nord, but it's a very underappreciated feature. Fast charging is a lot more convenient than you think, and I hope you guys get to try it out someday in some shape or form, if you haven't already. The Warp Charger 30T that comes with the OnePlus Nord charges the phone from 1% to 60% in a little bit less than 30 minutes, easily, so this can really come in handy. Some might argue that it's not as convenient as wireless charging, which the Nord does not support. But to be fair, most people looking into a smartphone at this price point most likely don't even have a good fast wireless charger, so there's something to think about. I do want to mention that with this phone, I'm extremely comfortable with not charging it overnight some days. So if I'm super tired or I just don't want to charge my phone yet for whatever reason, I can comfortably leave it out unplugged and expect no more than 1% or 2% less battery than what I had before. I wouldn't recommend doing this regularly, but if you ever do by accident, it's just nice to know that your OnePlus Nord won't drain ludicrously overnight. Plus, you have fast charging to help you speed up the charging process for time-sensitive situations, which helps prove my point that fast charging is a lot more convenient than you think. Since the Nord just came out earlier this month, I can't really assess whether or not these numbers will still hold up in two or three years' time. Not to mention, your usage may likely differ from mine, so you could get different results than what I have. But since Oxygen OS offers quite a few user-accessible battery preservation features, at least you'll be getting some peace of mind that your battery shouldn't be degrading significantly anytime soon. That peace of mind is something you unfortunately don't get with iPhones, for example which might be a hard statement for some people to suck in, but you have to admit that it's true. You can't just make up things like this. Now we can take a look at the cameras, which is where some of the more unattractive parts of this phone begin to emerge and show themselves. You get a vertical quad camera array on the back of the phone, which from top to bottom consists of an 8 megapixel ultra wide camera with a 119 degree field of view, a 48 megapixel main camera with OIS, a 5 megapixel depth sensor, and a 2 megapixel macro camera, all neighbored by a dual LED flash module to the right of that quad camera array. The 48 megapixel main camera is elevated by the Sony IMX586, which is the same sensor that's used for the main camera on the OnePlus 8. And this main camera is the best of the four rear-facing cameras that you'll be getting on the Nord, as you'll be seeing in a little bit. However, there is a catch. On the front of the phone, the dual camera setup consists of a 32 megapixel main camera and an 8 megapixel ultra wide camera with a 105 degree field of view. Unlike the main rear facing camera, the main front facing camera does not have optical image stabilization. However, the electronic image stabilization is pretty good, so this is honestly the least of my concerns. This main 32 megapixel camera is also the better of the two front facing cameras, and that is driven by the Sony IMX616 sensor. Overall, the Nord's main cameras, both the front and rear facing ones, have impressed me. Admittedly, I was under the impression that all of the Nord's cameras were bad before getting my hands on the Nord. But these two quote unquote main cameras are actually a lot better than I thought they would be. However, as a tech enthusiast, I am quite annoyed about one thing, and that is with how the photos from the main rear facing camera are handled. This is where that catch I mentioned earlier comes in. With the camera application that ships with the OnePlus Nord, the photos taken using the Nord's main rear facing camera only look their best when the photo resolution is set to 12 megapixels. The moment you toggle that resolution preference to 48 megapixels, you start getting a noticeable increase in softness and noise with photos taken using this main rear facing camera. Now, outside of comparison, these 48 megapixel photos honestly still look pretty decent. But you'd think that the 48 megapixel photos would have looked better than the 12 megapixel photos, right? After all, this main rear facing camera literally has the largest sensor of the four rear facing cameras. So I don't think it's unreasonable to be expecting this main camera to produce the best quality photos using the best possible settings. Although this main rear facing camera does indeed take the best photos of the four rear facing cameras. Do keep in mind that this is only true when said photos are taken at that aforementioned 12 megapixel photo resolution, 
which is not the behavior that I, nor any reasonable consumer, would be expecting. I was expecting this main camera to perform just as well when taking 48 megapixel photos, and nothing more. I'm not super aggravated about this catch, but it is somewhat disappointing to me. Automatic HDR always seems to be on, however I wish I could set it so that HDR is actually always on, and not just set to automatic all the time. I personally don't prefer HDR set to automatic, since this only enables HDR when the software basically thinks that HDR on would be appropriate. So sometimes I won't get photos with the dynamic range I'm looking for, and there's no way to manually turn this on when I actually want that on. Also, I found this cool insect while I was out hiking. I tried to take a photo of it, but it was moving extremely fast and I didn't want it to get into my shoe, so I was moving a lot. I wasn't able to get a clear picture of this insect, so you too probably won't be able to capture things that are moving really fast with the Nord. Just something to keep in mind. Of course, the OnePlus Nord does have a pro mode where you can adjust shutter angle and whatnot, and it can even take raw photos. However, this photo opportunity was immensely time sensitive, so I didn't have any time to waste for messing around with any camera settings. As far as the 8 megapixel ultra wide camera goes, I've seen a lot of reviewers say that it's not too great, but as long as whatever you're taking a photo of is extremely well lit, the photos actually turn out well beyond decent. The only time you ever really see fringing, for instance, is when the lighting conditions are complex or when your subject or background is too dimly lit. And in good lighting, the photos produced using this ultra-wide camera aren't really as soft as you think, so I'm not sure why so many reviewers are claiming that this ultra-wide camera is as terrible as they say it is because I highly disagree with them. At the very least, I do think that these photos are totally usable. Speaking of dim lighting, the nightscape shots you can take on the OnePlus Nord are a lot better than I thought. With the main camera, you get some surprisingly usable photos with a reasonably high amount of exposure and colors that are surprisingly true to life in these lighting conditions. Sometimes there is a visible amount of noise in the midnight blue or dark grayish areas of the Nord's nightscape photos, but overall, this is totally acceptable. The ultra-wide camera also supports nightscape mode. Although you have the option not to use nightscape mode when using the ultra-wide camera at night, nightscape does bring a lot more life to the ultra-wide camera than you think. The ultra-wide camera by itself already struggles with dimly lit subjects or backgrounds, so you might as well use it when taking ultra-wide photos at night. At the very least, this mode helps produce a usable ultra-wide photo, unlike how things could turn out without nightscape mode on. The assessment of these last two rear-facing cameras is going to be quick. I don't even think I should be considering the depth sensor as a camera, since it's not even user accessible, let alone functional. I'm not even sure what this depth sensor is doing for me. Covering the depth sensor didn't affect the quality of my photos even the slightest bit, and games like Pokemon Go don't seem to be using this depth sensor at all, not even for the AR-dependent features. I don't even think Pokemon Go can even detect this depth sensor. It's quite a joke. The macro camera reminds me of a Nintendo DSi camera, which, by the way, isn't a good thing. Like the Nintendo DSi camera, this 2 megapixel macro camera is, colloquially speaking, garbage. Even after the software optimizations that Oxygen OS 10.5.5 introduced specifically for the macro camera, photos are not usable whatsoever. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but this isn't exactly my definition of decent. I don't even think that it can come close to that definition. So to summarize everything, these last two cameras are useless. Now with the depth sensor, I just don't know what in the world it's doing. If OnePlus could be more transparent about what role this depth sensor is playing for this smartphone, then I probably wouldn't be so frustrated that it's here. But arguably more frustrating than this depth sensor is this garbage 2 megapixel macro camera which has absolutely no chance of ever being an actually useful feature. And trust me, I've tried my hardest to find a practical use for it, and I'm pretty confident that it doesn't have one. I don't even think that using this macro camera is fun, to be honest with you, and that's primarily because of how bad the photos produced from this macro camera turns out. It really made me think, if OnePlus hadn't put these useless cameras on the OnePlus Nord, I feel like they could have improved something else, like the ultra-wide camera, or the speakers. They probably could have even added a micro SD card slot for expandable storage in place of this wasted space. Again, these cameras are just completely useless and terribly unnecessary. If you don't want to take my word for it, then that's all on you. 
have fun with these two mediocre cameras, I guess. Or, I mean, with this one macro camera, I should say, since the other one doesn't seem to be doing much of anything. Now, the front-facing cameras are pretty nice, both of them actually, not just the main front-facing camera. Of course, that main camera is clearly the better of the two, and it actually takes full-resolution 32-megapixel photos, unlike its rear-facing counterpart. Both cameras don't do well in low light, and you can't use nightscape mode with them either, but at least you have display flash to help you out in some tight situations. I think that the most interesting part about the main front-facing camera is that you can film 4K video at 60 frames per second with that thing. With the rear-facing cameras, the best recording quality you can choose is 4K at 30 frames per second. With the rear-facing cameras, the best recording quality you can choose is 4K at 30 frames per second. I'm not sure if I'd like this, to be honest with you. I'd rather want the rear-facing camera to be able to take 4K video at 60 frames per second. But I suppose OnePlus can't really do anything about this now. Or can they? Anyway, videos are quite nice. Let's take a look at a few more videos. Here's a fairly dark room with a very complex lighting situation. We can see that our view uh, through this window is clipping quite a bit, and also clipping a lot more over here. Auto exposure is doing a pretty good job, but it's not perfect. As you can see, we have some clipping right over there. But overall, pretty, pretty nice, if I had anything to say about it. So of the six cameras that you get on the OnePlus Nord, only two of them are good, and those are the main front and rear facing cameras. You could probably argue for three, with the third good camera being the rear facing ultra wide camera, but you need a lot of light for that one to be able to perform well, so I personally wouldn't include it. Don't get me wrong though, that ultra wide camera is a lot better than some people perceive it to be. One of those two good cameras have a sneaky little catch behind them. But, if you think you'll be unbothered by that software-based compromise, then you can probably just ignore this catch. I mean, don't get me wrong, these 12 megapixel photos aren't, you know, bad, but I feel like all of us are ultimately here in the first place for that promise of having good 48 megapixel photos. And while the Nord can deliver 48 megapixel photos, they're not good 48 megapixel photos. 
You're just, uh, I don't know, I, average, I guess? <laughs> uh, it's ultimately nothing special is, I guess, what I'm trying to say. Let's move on to cellular connectivity. Once again, please keep in mind that this is a European review unit being used in the United States. It doesn't have support for some of the bands that some carriers use here where I live, so don't go thinking that my experience could apply to you if you're near a market that the Nord is actually coming to. Calling and texting over SMS somewhat works fine on the OnePlus Nord with T-Mobile here in the United States, but it's not perfect. At first, I thought that I wasn't having any issues receiving calls or text messages, so I was about to report in this review that my experience with calling and texting had been flawless. However, it has come to my attention that my Nord would sometimes not receive calls for some reason. For one, my parents regularly call me to ask how I'm doing, but recently they've told me a few times that they had called my number more than once and wondered why I didn't pick up. So that concerned me quite a bit. It made me wonder just how many other important phone calls I didn't receive while using the OnePlus Nord. Fortunately, outbound calls have worked flawlessly every time I needed to call someone. The only issues I have are with inbound calls, and I'm pretty sure that my APN settings have been correct, among other things, so the problem in question has to be beyond my reach. I've also had some trouble accessing the internet through my cellular data with the smartphone here in the United States. The APN settings weren't able to configure itself automatically, so I had to go in and configure all of that myself. Usually automatic setup works just fine. However, even after getting things up and running, my upload and download speeds were unusually terrible. Now, I thought it was just me and where I live being the issue, but I don't usually get these numbers, even where I live. And according to T-Mobile's coverage map, I should be able to peak at 4G LTE network speeds on my OnePlus Nord. The Nord supports the bands that are required for 4G LTE, so I'm quite perplexed as to why my speeds are so slow. I did look into this more extensively behind the scenes, but to make a long story short, I haven't been able to do anything about this yet, and I still have trouble accessing my cellular data sometimes. Hopefully by the time the OnePlus Nord does come to North America, that US variant will have better support for our network frequencies. Alright, so that was pretty much everything important that you need to know about the OnePlus Nord. I really like this phone. It's a nice, tall smartphone with an impressive high refresh rate display, a solid software experience thanks to Oxygen OS, decent battery life, and decent primary cameras. But you have to understand before getting the smartphone that the Nord isn't perfect. While some parts of this phone are outstanding, other parts of this phone just don't seem right at all, with the biggest offender being these two useless cameras on the back. I mean, let's be real, nobody's ever going to use those. Now, the biggest selling point of this phone, the 90Hz refresh rate, is something that really only enthusiasts can appreciate to its fullest. If you don't really understand what high refresh rate displays can do for you, then this is probably going to be the end of the conversation for you, because the moments you overlook that 90Hz refresh rate, the OnePlus Nord is almost just like any other mid-range Android smartphone. Now, to be fair, there aren't many mid-range smartphones out there that have a 90Hz AMOLED display, but at the end of the day, that's kind of all this phone really has going for it. It's arguably the only thing that makes this phone stand out a little bit more next to its competition. Overall, I do recommend the OnePlus Nord. It's a very solid smartphone that offers quite a handful of features for something that is priced so modestly. So if you're in the market for a new smartphone right now, I would highly suggest putting this guy on your list of options to choose from. But if you're looking for something that has a headphone jack or expandable storage, then you may want to look elsewhere because the only thing that I think would make or break most people's decision to buy this phone is the exclusion of these two aforementioned features. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys again in my next video.